we started this group called Hispanics for Wilson, which was a militant self-deportationist group. And we promised to uh, deport ourselves back to Mexico right. to support Governor Wilson's uh, anti-immigrant policies. And everybody believed it. <laughs> it was, yeah. uh, you know, the best, the best satire, the best hoaxes are the extra ridiculous ones because they're more satisfying when people are like, believe it. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? Good. Ah. Well, whatever that was, it was the sound of like a, a like a diet soda or something, or a like right. Was that what that was? I'm hooked on these lemon uh, sodas. The, those are good. Those Pellegrinos. Anyway, <laughs> well, thank you for coming on, Lalo. I'm Priscilla. This is Jesse. Nice to meet you. Nice. Yeah, That's great nice. to meet you. And. Um, there's a lot of news right now for you to be drawn about, isn't there? What oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> Where do ideas for for a, a, a comic strip or a, an image come from? Well, it's a mystery. I mean, uh, most of the time, if I'm lucky, they they just pop into my head. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, after 30 years of doing it, you know, it's kind of comes naturally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I... I get an idea, pops in my head, and I have to really work it out. And that hasn't happened to me in a long time. But I just recently did a cartoon where it's about the missing texts with the uh, Secret Service, right. Homeland Security, and Department of Defense. And I had to work out the mechanics of these guys walking off with a letter where it's spelled cover up initially, and then it's spelled coup. Right. Like, right. But it took a lot of acrobatics to figure it out. I was like, hey, hey, hey. I, I hadn't done that in a while where it just didn't pop into my head. So. so is it is it do you have to work it out with a pen or do you work it out with the ideas? I, I work it out in my head usually. And mm. it, something that just comes out worked out and I just <laughs> have to put it down. And that's a good day, you know, and that's most days. So you're at a big swap meet with your your mom down near the border and you see this injustice, right? And, you know, how old are you and do you immediately recognize that this is injustice? Does this go right in your head at that moment? Yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, technically in the big scale of things, it's near the border, but physically, you know, it was inside San Diego County. So, you know, I'm like, and I must have been like eight years old, 10 years old probably closer to eight or even younger. And uh, these guys have made it inland enough, but they are running through this swap meet, uh, the Spring Valley swap meet. And the way you park on it is you're kind of, it's in a bowl kind of, you know, it's in a, a canyon sort of, and you park up on the street and you look down, you kind of walk your way down. At least that's how it was back then and uh, you could see the whole scene of the swap meet and people come into it and you could i could see it was like we're in a helicopter watching a car chase you know these guys are running through everyone stopped and watching these like three four guys running trying to escape the border patrol and it's not something you see every day you know it wasn't like you know like a crime scene per se or they didn't mug anybody they were just trying to run for their lives and it was like it registered then that this is weird you know th those guys are mexican but hey we're mexican too like you know why are they running from the border patrol or those cops or whatever and it, it never left me and i just thought well this can't be right you know as a little kid you know little kids have the best sets of uh you know we're born with it right with justice you know and I, I just, I don't know. I think that was my kickoff event. <laughs> and at the same time, were you also drawing every day in a notebook or something? Where did this skill as, a, as an artist come from? I was that kid that always, uh, you know, all the cartoonists will say, I'm that kid that drew in the margins of the papers at school instead of paying attention. And, you know, I, I also paid attention, <laughs> but it really runs in my family. It, it I have family in Mexico that were uh, artists and painters and singers mm. and, and even had a radio show. They were announcers. They were a couple of cousins of mine, first cousins. Back then in, in their time, they there wasn't even a university 
where they lived. They lived in Sinaloa State uh, in Mazatlan. And they had to go to Mexico City to you know, get a college education. And it was a perfect storm. And my cousin, uh, you know, being a college student, kind of a, you know, 70s hippie dude. And he would uh, paint little like, you know, planet scenes. And he turned me on to like UFOs and turned me on to the Beatles. And it was like the big brother I, I never had that like showed me all the cool stuff and showed me that it was in our in our blood to draw, you know, and, and, and be artistic. But anyway, the part about going to Mexico city is, you know, they had to go uh, to university there. They studied uh, to become CPAs because duh, they didn't want to starve to death being an artist. Right. Right. (laughs) So So I'm the first person in the family to, to make uh, art my uh, living and not have to do a side job. Now, do you, Before the LA Weekly, were you drawing topical art or were you just thinking about, you know, I mean, like what what brings you to the LA Weekly and, you know, how does that all happen? I don't Is that even around? I mean, that was a great. Is it even around? I don't think it is. is It's a a shell of what it was, you know, Uh, Yeah, mostly cannabis ads and stuff. And so for the audience, it was sort of I think of it like the Village Voice or it's not as well known. What's the Village Voice? Yeah, well, exactly. (laughs) These, these, These listeners, watchers. If you're under a certain age, won't know, but it was local, culturally relevant, always pretty much swinging to the left, I would say. And there was one in San Francisco as well that uh, that they had one. But anyway, go on. Sorry. I did yeah, that. sure. The Guardian. Was it The Guardian? Oh, Day yeah, Guardian? yeah. Yeah, exactly. Was, uh, yeah, it was a golden age of... Uh, Progressive all, journalism. <laughs> all weeklies. Yeah. I mean, they had your, your band listings. They had political articles. They had cool cartoons. Yeah. And uh, they were and it uh, was paper, everybody. Paper and they it up and you read it out on Thursday for the weekend, <laughs> you know, and, and and it was before the internet. So it had restaurant guides, everything. And uh, that was like the scene, you know, the place for that kind of was a perfect fit for me. Prior to that, before I tell the story of the LA Weekly and how I got into that, was like any other editorial cartoonist. When the editorial cartoonist is in college, they are usually the editorial cartoonist for the college paper. And so I did that as that was my first regular kind of political thing. Prior to that, I think I would I was just a cartoonist that just drew funny stuff and made fun of people and uh, was just kind of trying out what this whole thing was about. And but so I get to the LA Weekly via... I already gone to Berkeley for graduate school in architecture, but up there I met a couple of guys that uh, we started a sketch comedy group called the Chicano Secret Service. And so, now were were you using that because you could draft? Is that what you were doing in architecture school, or were you thinking about building buildings? I just I was thinking of building buildings. I love design a lot, and uh, it's just a you know a plastic art to me, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I was really good at making models. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But I'm also very good at drawing. It was really from San Diego State. I had this wild uh, Cajun hippie professor straight from the 60s, Gene Ray, who mm-hmm. turned me on to environmental design. Same place that a, a, a person I ended up working with at Pixar on the movie Coco, which we can talk about later, Darla Anderson, the executive producer of the movie. We were in the same crazy department and it, it it turned out a couple of weirdos like us you know it was that we didn't do architecture and you know that's that's kind of the the curse of architecture schools only barely 50 percent of uh, our, those students go on to be architects you know so right but i love design i love the environment uh i love drawing things in uh, perspective when i uh when i draw my cartoons to show off you know and... well that's a metaphor isn't it for what you do you put things in from your <laughs> i do perspective in proper perspective yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> so i met these guys and I, I i basically at that point where it was at berkeley I wanted to perform and do comedy and mm-hmm. i just wanted to stretch out all my every artistic muscle i had so We were not bad at it. We became known a little bit in the 90s and even got on TV. And then I ended up in L.A. trying to get into Hollywood. Uh, And uh, and that's where the the scene was, that Chicano art scene, the Chicano performance and music scene, poetry, everything was there. I mean, that's where Rage Against the Machine came from. That's where Zach de la Rocha came from. That's where 
you know, lots of bands like Ozo Motley and lots mm-hmm. of, you know, writers and artists and stuff. And uh, it was just a great, it was a great time. And, you know, I didn't have a care in the world, you know? <laughs> and so uh, out of that scene was uh, Ruben Martinez, who's a writer uh, and he was an editor there at the LA Weekly. And uh, this little thing called the LA Riots happened. Mm-hmm. And the whole city of L.A., at least some of it, uh, some of the institutions decided maybe we should open up a little bit. You know, maybe mm-hmm. we're, we're being too restrictive and it's similar to the reckoning we're kind of having now. It, it comes in cycles, right? Now, what were your feelings during the riots? Oh, I was in the riots. My girlfriend and I, uh, who is now my wife, we went straight to Parker Center to uh, protest the LAPD on the first night of the, when the, uh, the verdicts were read, uh, and we got bowled over, we got knocked over by, by the cops, you know, and that uh, was, it was, you know, for, uh, that was our ground zero. It was the political part of the riots we were there at Parker center. We marched on downtown, but then it just went kablooey after that. You know, I mean, people were really frustrated and angry and, now, you were know, you scared during the riots or were you? Uh, not not until a couple of days in, <laughs> a couple of days in when it didn't stop. And then, you know, it's threatened to come even, you know, parts of East L.A. even, you know, were, were rioting too after a couple of days. And it was like, wow, you know, I had a I had a gig up, I think maybe in, in Santa Barbara or Ventura. I had a speaking gig or something up there and I drove up. And I remember seeing just tons of sheriffs from the Central Valley crews going down and then the National Guard and everybody on the freeway heading down to L.A. And I was like, "Uh oh, this is bad, you know, but uh, we were righteous in the, in the beginning. You know, it was like, you know, we were right to be angry. And that's the, the attitude that I, uh, you know, I, I went I got a meeting with the head of the L.A. Weekly. Thanks to Ruben Martinez. He, he said you should let him pitch your comic strip. I pitched LA Cucaracha, which was the first version of my comics. And they said, okay, pitch it. And I, I made a bunch of comics and they only rejected one and said, all right, you got it. Keep going. No. Great. Do you remember why they rejected the one? Yeah, it sucked. It was not. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a technical term? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Editors do that all the time. Yeah. yeah now, that comic was, um, you know, syndicated in 60 different magazines, you know, different different uh, periodicals, yeah? Well, that was in the 90s. I did, uh, you know, alt-weekly panel, right? So uh, along the lines of like Ernie Pook or Life in Hell and all these, you know, I mean, me and uh, Matt Graney, you know, creator of The Simpsons, were practically the last two people at the LA Weekly by the time mm. everything ended in like around 2017. It kind of... Meh. And uh, he ended his run and I was like, uh oh, that means I'm out. But, uh, you know, my, my strip evolved and I turned it into doing editorial cartoons. Right. And then at one point in 2002 circa, I got asked to pitch a daily comic strip. And so I said, well, I'm going to go with La Cucaracha. Is that all right? And they said, yeah, sure. You know, I already had the characters and I look forward to doing like a daily version of it. And that's when that started. So I'm, I'm celebrating my 20 year anniversary of doing the the daily strip. And yeah, it was in about 60 or 70 papers, maybe. And then uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> oh. papers died. Yeah. How hard is it to do a daily, a thing that appears daily? It, it's, it's, you know, I, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's, I don't think it's as hard as people think, you know, you're not drawing one cartoon a day. You have to kind of do them all in a batch Mm-hmm. So, you know, come up with the ideas on Monday, work them out, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, draw them out and turn them in Thursday night. And basically that's like my schedule and they come out in 10 days. I think the hardest part is, you know, not repeating yourself, which, uh, you know, uh, Charles Schultz famously said the job of the, you know, cartoonist is to draw the same thing every day and not repeat ourselves themselves you know right that's the angriest yeah. dog in the world right <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, yeah. yeah that's a david lynch cartoon that is a repeat every single day yeah yeah, yeah. And some cartoonists were hanging out and talking about that the other day. that's funny did they like it or did they hate it well i think 
we liked it and respected it, you know, for what it was and yeah. it was a good gimmick. But after a while, I mean, yeah. 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 So, so I have a question. You're, I mean, I think when you're doing this, there aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of representation, Mexican representation, was there at this point? Are yeah. you the only, are you the first? Like, you know, and how are you thinking about your, do you think you're responsible to your audience? Who is your audience? Or are you just drawing about what bothers you? Clearly, that is what you do. But, sure. what, you know, what is that? What is that like? Is that too much responsibility? What is that like? Well, at the, at the risk of forgetting the last part of the question, <laughs> I'll go back and say I was not the first, um, but in the grand scheme of things, when I was a kid, I would read the first uh, ever Latino to be syndicated in the United States to have a daily comic strip. And that was a strip called Gordo by uh, Gus Ariola, a cartoonist who's Mexican-American from Tucson. And that I still remember reading that in the Sunday papers all the way. It, it ran all from... 1942 with a little break for army service and then and then all the way to 1985 and this guy was like an amazing artist and uh, was the the first you know and when I was about to launch mine I found out that I was not going to be the second because a guy I know who does a strip called Baldo it's like a family strip he ended up being the second really he's a team and he doesn't write so uh, technically, I am the second, um, <laughs> but uh, pretty much I'm, I'm the third in U.S. history to be uh, syndicated, you know, as. as uh, now, now, what about a cockroach? What's the significance of a cockroach? <laughs> oh, and this this can go part of, you know, to the question about the audience. Yes. I draw for, right? We'll get you there. I draw for myself. I try to crack myself up. I try to make my political points. I know that I have a community that I'm responsible to. And I know that, you know, we have some, you know, shared touchstones like La Cucaracha, you know, La Cucaracha is the, you might know it as the, the, the song, uh, you know, made famous during the Mexican revolution. It has a history of uh, kind of being a, uh, a song that kind of regular folks, it's like a ditty that you could change the lyrics to. You, you could uh, make fun of people and satirize people in power with. And it has a tradition all the way back to Europe. But it was made famous here during the Mexican Revolution and became, you know, a top five hit <laughs> in, the, in the 1920s or something. But it's an image used by Chicano writers, you know, to kind of describe like the stubbornness of the Mexican population, you know, like we won't go away. We're there's a lot of us. People don't get, like to, yeah. people don't get. like to see us. They don't like us in the spotlight, and we will still come out, and we won't go away. Now, do you need the cockroach in there for Eddie and Vero to have something to work against? Like, how does is it necessary to have that tension for the for it to work? You know, I mean, it, it's necessary to kind of explain, like, you know, Eddie and and Cuco are basically my two halves you know like half of me wants to watch the game and have a beer and just party and chill and the other half wants to have a political speech every five minutes about everything that's going wrong with the world that has to be fixed and that that's the initial tension of the strip the environment shown in the strip is like when I was 25 and I didn't have a care in the world so I was basically Eddie and but I also was political and I was questioning my role in, you know, American society. And Vero represents kind of stability and she uh, represents my wife who's a school teacher. So people ask me, are you a school teacher? Because your school teacher gags are like, huh? I'm like, no, I'm a long suffering spouse of a school teacher. <laughs> so uh, that, that's the dynamic as I imagined it uh, for the strip. Now, Mitt Romney not really being able to understand irony, I guess, you know, like, you know, what was that moment like when you, why are you having Deporte and not, you know, why does that need a new character? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, if, if, if you're talking about the whole self-deportation thing and all that, that was like a kind of a well-known kind of a performance piece I did uh, that started in the early 90s during the Proposition 187 era in California and all the talk about 
um, you know, passing laws where undocumented people and their children who were born here could not use, uh, you know, public facilities or I called it the hovering over the sidewalk legislation. You know, they wanted Mexicans to just float and not touch anything, but still do the work, right? <laughs> right. Magically. So I became this character, Daniel Deportado. And we started this group, you know, my, my friends I used to do a magazine with called Pocho Magazine. We did this, uh, started this group called Hispanics for Wilson, which was a militant self-deportationist group. And we promised to uh, deport ourselves back to Mexico to support Governor Wilson's uh, anti-immigrant policies. And everybody believed it. <laughs> it was, yeah. you know, the best, the best satire, the best hoaxes are the extra ridiculous ones because they're more satisfying when people are like, believe it. I, I mean, it's hard to do it now can still be done because we've entered into the satire dimension, you know, like- Yeah, uh, where there is no more satire. Well, wait, yeah, I mean, yeah. Where, what have we entered into? Yeah, what kind I of satire, what sure. kind of satire could you do now, you know? There's no yeah. irony left, you That's know? That's why I'm happening. asking, like, are you, I mean, I don't mean to jump ahead, but like, how do you even take on and tackle what's going on? Because there's not even an understanding of what is satirical. Well, do you do you think it's actually unique? You you know, you talk about the riots, you talk about earlier seeing this thing in the in the swap meet. You know, it's like all these years, have there been comparatively still years, or is this injustice always around? And is this a part of the fabric of our lives? I you know, I think that maybe a veil has been lifted. Maybe that's it. You know, maybe it's uh, I mean, I'm <laughs> Not maybe it's always been bad. It, it, it has always been, uh, you know, for certain people, for certain groups. And I don't know, it's possible that now it's, it's not just a few people can see what's really going on. Now, maybe everybody can see what's going on and half the population can't handle it. You know, They can't accept it. I don't know. We're, it's, it does feel weird right now. It's just things are kooky as ever but the the cha our challenge is to keep you know making the funnies <laughs> is it that's the challenge but is it a responsibility you know is it something you're you you have to do that you're compelled to do oh yeah i was uh i was telling this group of cartoonists like we'll get public feedback and people are like thank you for you know doing what you do you know you really helped me get and and it is like about helping people get through things with humor but really, it's that's how we get through. That's how I get through life, uh, is laughing at it, um, not in an unserious way, but in a de deadly serious way. And I feel like sometimes it's not the work we're doing for people, but it's it's our therapy. You know, we we have to stay sane or close to it, or else all 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 you guys are gonna go crazy too. We can't all be crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> When you go into work at Pixar and you go in the offices, do they know that you did Megro Mouse? <laughs> oh, uh, well, when I did uh, go in, yeah, I mean, they, you know, uh, I, I could probably tell the story that Darla Anderson, who I mentioned uh, from my San Diego State Aztec alumni, who's executive producer of the movie, who hired me a year after, and well, not Migra Mouse, but Muerto Mouse. I mean, Migra Mouse is the original Disney bashing cartoon I did. And then in 2014, it was Muerto Mouse bashing them for trying to trademark the term Dia de los Muertos. So a year later, I was hired by, uh, by Darla to consult on the movie Coco. And after the movie, and we, I think we did a pretty decent job, she told me, uh, don't say anything, but Disney did not know that I hired you. <laughs> <laughs> we like her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She says the upper brass over there had no idea. But they had seen my comic, you know, and knew who I was. Yeah. But I guess that they're, they're not that hands on where they could tell her what to do. But why? But she worried because you were you're so kind of con they're not controversial, but progressive. Like, what was the problem? Uh, you know, because I'm, I, I, I guess I was just known as the guy that me and the community, we beat them at the trademark thing. And mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, we, we, we at least flailed them for supporting the Republican anti-immigrant candidate. And, you know, it's just not, not the vibe. I think that uh, most employers will want, I actually just kind of lost a job. I didn't, I didn't get hired for a TV job, but I was honest about the executive producer for this kid's show 
that was in development and I was going to be the consultant for it, the cultural consultant. And this guy had threatened to sue me 25 years ago at the LA Weekly. And he is a, a well-known international, uh, let's just say music producer dude who uh, did not like me photoshopping him as Fidel Castro. <laughs> let's just say that and calling him certain names um but now, what did you think of james franco as uh, fidel castro oh my god <laughs> good loop there good. wow yeah. i just did some strips and oh um by the way my in my comic strip i now have the luxury of having an assistant artist that mm. helps me draw oh, nice. the strip it helps me do all these other things you know yeah uh, that i'm trying to do and i told him his name's joaquin i go joaquin I think we need to do three days of James Franco coming <laughs> around and impersonating everyone in the comic strip, uh, <laughs> you know, and taking their jobs. You oh, know? that's funny. Did yeah, you do that? And, uh, he goes, all right. And we're going to do three more because I think this is a, a funny idea. So, we're, yeah, you know, he hasn't he hasn't impersonated Vero yet. Yeah, so that's got <laughs> that's a good idea. That's going to be good. But yeah, no, I, I, it's just the same old thing, you know. There's not a pipeline of leading Latino men in Hollywood or or superstar Latinas. There's like, you know, two, three of them. You know, J Lo takes up all the oxygen, and, mm -hmm. and because there's not opportunities for Latino actors to take on roles like Fidel Castro, man, talk about a meaty role. Yeah. My God, you know, I mean, who who wouldn't want to do that? Because this. Stuff happens all the time. They find a white guy, however, one eighth or one sixteenth Portuguese uh, yeah. he is. You know, that's yeah. that whole Cherokee princess thing. You know, like yeah. get out of here with that. And they they do all this gymnastics to to deny another Latino actor a a a, a big juicy role in Hollywood. And it just you know, it just happens every day. You know, what do the kids say today? Microaggressions. You know, these are all macro aggressions You're right and they just won't stop do you think it's changing or no i i hope so i mean it's just got a bad you know taint to it it's just yeah. you know i hope it ends up you know sounds like a great project i mean and I, I got nothing against james franco you know he probably was like yeah sure you know i mean who wouldn't but <laughs> well, it's he, wrong he, on so many levels you know yeah he probably is. He'd probably play any role at this point. You know yeah. I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that's the funniest thing is uh, when people were on Facebook arguing about this thing, you know, most of the women were like, wait a minute, this guy's a molester, you know, <laughs> isn't he allegedly a molester or this, this and that? And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah that too, you know, but, uh, you know, stay on topic, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Notice well, how I said allegedly, I don't want uh, him to come to me either. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you and you take on a lot of comments. I, 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 I've read and heard. You just let them on, bring them on. Yeah, yeah. You're brave. You're brave. <laughs> One day I'm gonna unblock all the hundreds of people I've had to block because they go crazy. They, like, even people I've known, you know, just they lose it with me, and they just want to tell me what to think. And I'm like, guys, you're barking up the wrong tree. You know, let's. Let's go on with our lives here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you lost any friends over that? You know, I lost a couple of friends over conspiracy theory thinking and COVID. Mm. Yeah. I sure did. And yeah. I think the other the other people that claimed to be my friends weren't really my friends, you know? But yeah. uh, in, in, during this weird period we went through, I, and, and plus I was working on, you know, for the state of California doing uh, COVID hesitancy cartoons and stuff. and fighting misinformation and I just couldn't bear to see it with you know a couple of friends that I uh, you know it's just it's tough. Yeah. like you lose them to a cult or something like, yeah yeah really it's taken over half the country but you know, yeah yeah big cult I, 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 didn't, I didn't get it you know yeah hello thank you so much for hanging yeah, out thanks for telling us about the history and the person and your perspective Oh, sure. You know, my uh, business partner would want me to say that I started a production company, uh, okay. Pocho Villa uh, Productions, to, with him and a couple friends to uh, bring real stories, you know, to movies, mm -hmm. not just talking crap about 
lack of representation, but, you know, want to do something about it yeah. and bring the stories that will give opportunities for Latino actors and native actors to shine. You know, we, we don't want it to be just like a little blip, you know, we want to make it a movement. And, and so what's the name of this? What's the name of it? It's called Pocho Villa Productions. So it's okay. kind of like Pancho Villa, but it's Pocho, which is, uh, you know, uh, the the once derisive nickname for Mexican Americans. So there's a lot of roles in there for James Franco, right? Oh yeah, I can't <laughs> wait to cast him as uh, you know Moctezuma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. Hey, Real th pleasure. Th thank you. This is the best formatted podcast I've ever been on. This yeah. <laughs> Just start talking. <laughs> yeah, that's the way we like to. Yeah. Roll. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, you guys. Thanks.